Yo, welcome back to another Breathe Pulse. Dave is here. Thanks for tuning in. Uh, we got another pulse with Gabriel today, our beloved Gabriel. And um, as always, it's going to be an exciting Dharma. We'll go for about an hour tonight. And um, we'd really love it if you'd drop a, a question or comment or, or musing for Gabriel. It makes it really fun to, to riff back and forth with the folks in the chat. So even if you don't have a question, just drop us a hello and we will get going. An exciting week for Breathe. We've got our dates pinned down July 7th through the 10th, 2022. It's going to be really, really good to see everyone back live in person and planning is starting to ramp up. So if you're looking for volunteer submissions, workshops, all that sort of stuff, uh, stay tuned. That stuff will drop probably December or January. And yes, very exciting times. Um, without further ado, let's bring in the Meisty, Gabriel Halper. Hello. How are you doing? I Good. Love it. Yes, you know, you can say Meisty if you want to because that's how it's spelled. But actually, it's really the Meister without the R. Ah, uh, you, you've dropped the R and an inverse silent R, huh? Exactly. Well, oh, I guess maybe if you if you spoke German, Meister. There you, you go. You could have the R sound, but really just have the E at the end, right? So what are we chatting tonight? Well, tonight my talk is about Sankalpa or intention. I think that when we sent out the copy to everybody, we were acknowledging If I can go back and remind everybody of the copy, I said that things are opening up a bit more, but we're still not out of the pandemic yet. And whatever you set your mind to do, that's your next creative choice. And to that end, you know that yoga is the first thing I pitch, although I try to expand it out of the classical technique to, to understand what is the Americanization of the Dharma. But it is a motivational boost to everything that's worthwhile in your life. And that's why I'm always pushing practice, although I say any art form that you get into, that can be your practice. It doesn't have to be the traditional yoga practices. But if you want to give emergence to what I call your next most radiant self, so we're going to talk about attention density and what does that mean to shift what I call your happiness set point. And uh, this is going to lay the foundations for 
uh, your future success and how you set things up not to fail. How do you set things up to succeed? But you got to diligently and intelligently apply this so that you learn what I call the four or five P's, passion, purpose, persistence, perseverance, and peace. And when they all coalesce, you get a strong base from which to move out into the world and bring your specific brand of blessing because you all have gifts. And that's what I'm here to help you do is to help bless you, right? Acknowledge you and encourage you. So we'll get it into that in a little bit. So basically that's where I'm at for tonight. But first, a little song. There's nothing wrong with bringing the Las Vegas act into the whole thing. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight, shining down upon us, glorious and bright. Gonna miss you every day, but I know that you're all right. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. There's a peace in my heart, finally moving on. A calm in my conscience that sings this song. No longer will you struggle, no longer will you fight. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. Let the love shine down, let the love shine down. Let the love shine down, let the love shine down. I'm gonna miss you every day. But I know that you're all right. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. There's a break in the clouds. The sun is shining through. Speaks to my soul in the voice that sounds like you. When I lay my head down and gently close my eyes. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. Let the love shine down. Let the love shine down, let the love shine down, let the love shine down. I'm gonna miss you every day, but I know that you're alright. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. I'm gonna miss you every day, know that you're alright. There's a brand new star up in heaven tonight. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So, first of all, I want to honor anybody who's passed away in the pandemic. And I don't know about you, but I don't have to go for six degrees of separation. For those who haven't heard me talk about before, you know, we took one of our favorite aunts, my wife and I, to the hospital and then you couldn't go in and we didn't see her for the next five weeks and then she passed. So for me, there's no degrees of separation. And so if you know anybody, whether they just got COVID and soldiered through some bad symptoms, whether or not you know people, know people and somebody's passed away, uh, let's honor that and, and recognize how horrific that's been for all of us, how desperate we all are to try to get back to some semblance of normalcy. So now that I've uh, said that, next thing I want to do is remind you to share poetry. I always like to share poetry. Hi, Tim from Iowa, glad you're here. Um, poets say it good. And there have been articulate men and women throughout history in different cultures who are able to tap into the vision, the ultimate moving toward the omega point where we make it good for everybody. And now maybe for the first time in history, we have all the goods and services available, just not the political will. We haven't evolved yet that, as a species. So I've always been into what I would call the mystic understanding, the vision of wholeness, the vision of unity. And as an elder in my, my community, they say, you never leave the people without a vision of hope. So poetry teaches you how to penetrate language. Look at the symbolism. Look at the subtext, look at the metaphors and take them personally, psychologically, so you can understand that symbolic thinking is the mother tongue of humanity. And you can learn to appreciate other people in the way they express it 
Here's how Jalaluddin Rumi expresses it in his poem, Love Dogs. One night a man was crying, Allah, Allah. His lips grew sweet with the praising until a cynic said, so uh, I've heard you calling out, but have you ever gotten any response? The man had no answer to that. He quit praying and fell into a confused sleep. He dreamed he saw Kidder, the guide of souls, in a thick green foliage. Why did you stop praising? Because I never heard anything back. This longing you express is the return message. The grief you cry out from draws you toward union. Your pure sadness that wants help is the secret cup. Listen to the moan of a dog for its master. That whining is the connection. There are love dogs no one knows the names of. Give your life to be one of them. So you have to understand that the part of us that is longing for union, union by, by longing by definition is the state of dissatisfaction. It's wanting something to exist that doesn't exist. That's why it has sadness connected to it. The key is to have union with the longing, to accept the fact that we're a species that moans for this. And yet, like the love dog, that moaning is the connection itself, rather than postponing it and think that you're not getting it. That very urge, you, that thing which you are seeking, is seeking you. So I want to talk about some of these things. And first, in terms of intention for going ahead, right? whose responsibility is it for creating the future? Politicians? Media? Venture capitalists on Wall Street? Religious fanatics? If there's any truth to personal responsibility, which means, is it possible for me to make things happen? And of course, the answer is yes, because yoga certainly says the buck stops here. You are personally responsible for choosing to do this. So, Here's the question, which could be the gobsmacking to the side of your head to wake you up. Can you let go of the rudder and hope you drift in the right direction? There's some agency here. I know some of you heard me say, you know, no bottle hops off the shelf, uncorks itself, pours itself into a glass and forces you to drink it to become an alcoholic. There's some choice there. No weed hops out of the ground, rolls itself into a doobie. And shot, you know, lights itself up and shotguns you till you're blitzed. There's some agency here. So I want to talk about that. And we're going to get into what I call neuroplasticity. I want to explain that a little bit more. And I hope that what I'm about to share both in this PowerPoint presentation and then in my general commentary after that lights the fire of aspiration and allows you to overcome rigor mortis of the imagination. Not something that's really taught in school. In your undergraduate self, I understand. You're learning what other people have to say. But if you're going to graduate and move on to, you know, postgraduate, we say master's or PhD work, that's when you're supposed to criticize the existing form of knowledge. Find the chinks in the armor. Find the holes of what they don't do well and take it to the next level which is what we're supposed to pass on as part of the commonality of human history. So now I'm going to go through this PowerPoint presentation and see where we are. There we go. So the first thing is intention. My intention is this. Make feeling good my top priority. Number one. Number two. See number one. Nothing is more important than that you feel good. Even though it may seem like that's selfish. Why should I feel good? Because your goodness is something you can bring to the world. And the world desperately needs more people who are good, kind, compassionate, funny, service-oriented, open hearts, broad-minded. That's all you guys. 
you have access to every form of spirituality that's existed that we know about which people didn't understand that before they were ignorant of this these were small esoteric groups that met to talk about this and how to do domesticate intuition you got it at your fingertips yes so if you want to understand how to put the puzzle pieces together and recognize that there are different kinds of disciplines that if you do it intelligently and diligently consistently and correctly it is a success system that never fails there's knowledge to be learned there's technique which is know-how that's how you put it into practical application and there's inspiration of the past masters of the form whose life is too far convincing to overlook just the statement that there are human beings like that it inspires hope and aspiration on your part now what you learn is attention this is the whole key to understanding that your attention is solid gold what you will put your attention into what you willfully direct your attention to will either flower blossom or wither on the vine and this is connected to the affirmations that I always share with people freely the law of attraction states that which is like unto itself is drawn and this is not only attention density which I'll get into in a little bit but it's also the latest kind of coaching in the business world which is called appreciative inquiry or they also call it quantum zero which means what you focus on is what you get it's like an old law what you sow so shall you reap so we have a responsibility about what we call what we allow to come through us yes you're not responsible for every random thought that pop that pops in your mind that maybe doesn't have a good good ending it's a bad seed but you can cultivate it you can be aware of that and choose not to put energy into that and by choosing to turn your attention away from it it withers and what you're going to focus on you're going to get more of because the law of attraction will help that to be more all right so now attention density has to do also with what i call neuroplasticity now neuroplasticity to a certain extent is experience dependent that means that we all have had experiences that condition us to believe that that experience is the only experience that's possible so we end up seeing life through that particular viewpoint but once you understand that you do not make the limitation of your own personal experience the measurement of all possibilities ah then you realize you can train your mind and change your brain that means with intensive focus on a new learning experience hence we'll get back to yoga in a moment you create a structural change in your brain in other words new synapses can be connected you can hardwire you can fire these neurons and make another groove in your brain that shifts your attention away from the previous experience dependent conditioning and now because your brain has plasticity it can be molded in a little bit you have to learn how to completely absorb yourself in whatever the field is and of course i'm going to explain it through yoga but you can see right away it isn't just yoga we're talking about if you'd like to change your happiness set point then yoga represents at least in this particular way I'm sharing it the eightfold path the eight petals on the yoga flower this is the yoga motivational tool I was talking about that makes everything in your life worthwhile it gives you results in the moment as well as in the long run because it's also an accrual system the more you do it the better you get at it the more you attract to yourself auspicious circumstances that bring people into your life who you have faith in and people who have faith in you people who you can trust and people who trust you people who you care about and people who care about you and so forth so the quick understanding here is yoga starts off by asking you to work with the ethics in your life to continue to be as moral and virtuous a human being as you possibly can now whether or not you want to set your set your your sights on sainthood and become unbelievably holy that's fine with me but you know as human beings we tend to sometimes 
fall off the path or perform less than we're really capable of. And maybe it's true that the ideal is not the real and that the actual is not the what should be. But we keep working on it because they say your reach should exceed your grasp. Other what's, otherwise, what's a heaven for? So the first thing is you work on things that you should abstain from. And the basic yoga thing, I know that most of you who practice yoga understand this. And to apply it is the whole thing, right? You're supposed to be aware of nonviolence, non-lying, non-stealing, non-addiction, and non-miserliness. Said positively, work on being peaceful, truthful, honest, moderate in your use of everything, and generous. The karmic influences of those things in your life bring back freedom, a sense of gladness, happiness. You make well-being the, the, the dominant intent in your life. And it spreads, it radiates from you, it emanates from you because you don't have any ulterior motive to be violent to people, to lie to people, to rip off people, to body grab people non-consensually or inappropriately and to hold on to your stuff instead of to sharing the blessings that you have. And then they tell you these other things to sustain yourself. Abstain from the stuff that messes you up and kills you, creates bad karma, and then sustain yourself by working on your own pure intentions, your own contentment with the little things in life. You know, the best things in life aren't things. So you have to learn how to find the simplicity in your life. Like in my day, we said, drinking a cup of green tea, I stopped the war. Really simple. And then you do your discipline. You commit yourself fanatically, like going for the gold in Olympic training. It's called tapas in yoga. you got to have a breakthrough if you keep at it. And then, of course, they say, study what you're doing. Understand why you're doing this. Why is it in your, vest, your vested interest to keep at it, to do it day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year, decade after decade until it's a lifestyle? And then, of course, the whole idea is surrender. Surrender. Give it up. Don't do it for any other reason than the joy of doing it. The good feeling you get from doing it, which is definitely going to be passed on to you, to other people, because the mind at peace finds ways of affecting its environment. And they also remind you, don't only work with the body. And remember, I always say it's the joy of movement. You don't have to be an asana jock alone. You guys are slackliners. There you go. Whatever movement you do, I say this every time, keep moving, keep biking, keep rock climbing, keep skiing, keep skateboarding. The joy of movement. That's yoga asana in another form. And then they remind you, work with your breath. Your respiration has so much to do with your mood. If you're breathing appropriately, it's going to strengthen your immune system. Throughout this whole pandemic, you guys know, go to my website. I put out almost 300 pranayama videos. Didn't they say right away it's a respiratory-born illness? Get your breathing shit together. Right? You didn't hear one doctor say anything about that. Well, I can't help what they didn't say. I can tell you, yoga says right out front. Get your pranayama together. Find out what your life energy and the vitality is that you can create for yourself, both in the sense of amping yourself up when you're a court low and quieting yourself down when you're over the top. So you can either energize or tranquilize yourself with how you use the breath. And then they say, that's not even enough. Learn to relax yourself. And I don't mean just every day take time out for yourself. Factor into your life leisure living. Where's the part of you that understands that you're supposed to play and display yourself. You still have to be childlike without being childish. And remember, it's the job of children to absorb the world through body knowing and exploring through play. You don't have to change that as a human being, but you have to make sure that you take time out, you chunk time out for that which takes time, which is living in a chill lifestyle. And if you're too caught up with what media tells you is going on out there, then you end up fearful threatened, always looking for what's wrong or what's missing instead of creating it yourself. The joy is not elsewhere. It comes from what you choose to do and what you put your attention into. And they say, that's not, not, that's not even enough. Learn to sit still. All the big boys and girls sit. You don't want to call it meditation? It sounds too formal. Just spend time keeping your body from moving around and keeping your mind from being distracted by anything else. Don't sit still and listen to music. Don't sit still and jiggle your cell phone. No, just sit still and experience effortless being in silence. 
because so many teachings say that power collects around stillness. So if you feel you don't have any clout, sit still and shut up. And then get insight into your own thoughts. You'll see where your habits are coming from. And you'll see the things that's not worthy to put your attention into. Because if you put your attention into it, it's going to grow. Withdraw your attention from that and focus it on the moment-to-moment -moment experience. You'll see how much more fully alive you are when you're present with your life. And not just remembering the past or anticipating the future, both of which can only be momentary thoughts in the here and now. And remember, that's why they say the present is like a gift. Mm -hmm. you got to open it, though, to enjoy it. And so if you're doing the different kinds of meditative absorptions that yoga points you towards, then you end up with the joy of living, the joy of being, which has no other ulterior motive than the fact that you actually exist, the miracle of existence. Isn't that enough? Well, if you don't do the attention density thing, which means absorbing myself so totally in the material I'm learning, it burns away everything else. And I end up getting the infusion the power, the insight of that particular technique. And so that's how you get the emergence of your next most radiant self, because all of us in a certain way are nothing but slowed down light. Or one of my favorite things from Einstein was matter is spirit reduced to the point of visibility, just coagulating because it's, it's functioning at a slower rate of vibration than the speed of light. So that's why it appears to be solid on this plane. And also yoga says and reminds you that if you focus on the space between and above the eyebrows, the glabella is the technical name, medically speaking, you can have an insight into the clear light or the white light. It's one of the four ways that they suggest you can get into the samadhi state besides chanting Om, doing pranayama, and holding the breath after the exhale, focusing on your guru if you have one, or the fourth one is experience jyoti or light at your third eye. So it's a practice. Draw upon it if you're called to it. But the most important thing is to throw your heart over the bar. When you try these things, at first you might fail short of your endeavor but you'll be a better person than if you never attempted it at all. And you know, even if you fail, fail is an acrostic, an acronym for first attempt in learning. You can't expect to be perfect when you do these things. You know Zen master that's gonna just grab the pen and immediately take the calligraphy brush and make a perfect circle because you're not even thinking about it. You're in no mind, that's not gonna happen. You're going to make a mistake. You have to learn how to master the form until it becomes so fluid that it looks like it's happening spontaneously without any effort of self-consciousness on your part. But it's not because you put a lot of time in. So once again, aspire, right? The reach should exceed your grasp. Otherwise, what's heaven for? And then if you do this, you're going to get excited about this. I call this the thrillometer. In yoga, the passion, the zeal, the enthusiasm for this, the going for the gold, the being turned on, the being on fire, the having fire in your belly. You say, I'm all over this. It's called anyamanas in yoga, the seizure of the divine mind. I get the vision. I'm on fire with this. I'm not going to let anyone or anything douse my passion. Shut me down. Be a naysayer. Lose faith not look to my own inner depth to guide me. And that's a lot to say because, as one of my mentors said, if you say yes to the mystery of life and why things are the way they are, where it seems that there's such unfairness and injustice and hard to believe there could be any supernatural deity that would make a world like this. But once you say yes in the heart of darkness, so you're in, you're not hedging your bet, then you have to do what's called joyful participation in the sorrows of the world. So you don't try to pretend that you don't see it. You don't like take a, a, a dose of deny it all in the morning to get through life. You accept the fact that there's gonna be heartache 
and that your heart is already broken, so stop trying to protect it. And in fact, a broken heart is the only one, one worth having because without the humility and contrition that comes from realizing how hurtful it is to see what I call the nightmare of history or the catastrophe of life, you're not going to be moved to compassion. So if you understand that, then cease to be satisfied with convention. Stop shooting yourself in the foot. It's not beyond your reach. It's not beyond your grasp. But you have to develop what I call inspirational dissatisfaction. Just because you might have been initially bent out of shape by society's pliers, a part of you has to say, what else can you show me? Is this all there is? And of course, the answer is, it's not all there is. And so I hope you find your way to realizing that we have a lot of different ways that we can shift ourselves. You can learn to find that you have different brain waves and that you can move out of the beta state of waking consciousness through the alpha, the delta, and the theta state till you get into those deep, creative, inspirational, intuitional states. That we all have different neurochemicals in our brain, neurotransmitters, that can give us that feeling of felt rightness. It's called dopaminergics. That when you're on the path, it has a sense that I'm supposed to be doing this. It jazzes me. I don't even have to accomplish something. Just being on the way and knowing I'm doing something where I'm right on the beam, that in itself gives you an uplift. And then we say that you balance your hemispheres, like when you do different alternate nostril breathing in yoga, the lateralization of the breath helps to bring the right and left hemispheres into synchrony with them. And then as a result of that, the understanding of what we call the triune brain, the reptilian brain, that's before you even logically think about anything. And then the limbic brain that brings you into the mammalian understanding of territoriality and pair bonding and care for the young. And then eventually the prefrontal logical brain, the cortex that has you self-conscious and, and your understanding that you can unite these three different systems of the brain arousal state, of the reptilian brain, the, the floor brain, and the emotional brain with your logical brain and the one that can leap over itself into mystic awareness. And of course, if you do that, you end up with transformative learning, not the mere acquisition of knowledge, but something that's going to change you in a meaningful way. It's going to bring about a metamorphosis. And if there's any meaning to the word divine, which you can just say means that which is of surpassing excellence in embryonic form for many human beings, but nonetheless available, accessible, approachable in the right way, then you can fulfill your potential of your own humanity. So that's what I have to say about the uh, PowerPoint presentation. And now I want to continue to go on with my general exposition And I want to see here if anybody's saying hello on the comments here. So in order to do this, first I want to be honest. All of us are suffering. You don't have to be a Buddhist to recognize that there's a component of suffering in all of life. As you age, you suffer. Through sickness, you suffer. And of course, there's the suffering of death. If you want life to continue and you know it's not going to at some point, but I want to learn to transform the neurotic aspect of suffering into just common human misery. That's a huge leap for a lot of us. I'm not going to pour oil on the fire. I got enough as it is. So yoga, to me, is like a personal growth hormone. And it's telling you, if you do it a little, it'll change a little. If you do it a lot, it'll change a lot. And part of the change is not only accumulating, it's your ability to let go which is another way of saying flow because life is change. And if you're holding on, it's very hard to flow. Right? You're going against the tide. It's much easier to go with it. So that's why it's easy to say from like Thich Nhat Hanh's meditative point of view, if you let go a little, you have a little bit of peace. If you let go a lot, you have a lot of peace. And if you let go completely, whatever that word means, you have complete peace. So here's another thing, the ball's in each one of our parks. 
How much can you let go of? Even though in one way you cultivate being attached, and I want to talk about that in a second. But remember, I'm from a school which I would call myself a gymnosophist. I come from a lineage where you work the body, kaya sadhana, the treasure that's in the body, but you use your body awareness to create general awareness, not just about your anatomy or your mental state, but what do you take off of the mat, take the fruit of your practice into your daily life, and see how changing your perspective enables you to interact with other people in a very different way, usually one that is filled with service and compassion, and most of all, gratefulness and appreciation for every advantage you've had in your life, that now in terms of pay it forward, it's time to give back, not just once, but for the rest of your life as a lifestyle, to be a giver and not just a taker. Now, here's two things I'm gonna recommend for you to understand. Number one, one of the rabbinic teachings that I like to share, and of course this goes along with what I would call satya, or truthfulness, is the quality of your speech, how you talk to people, is the single most determinative factor about whether or not you inherit a portion in the world to come. So whether or not you really want to think that there is something after you die that you're going to be held accountable for, or just get the image without trying to like find out, is it really true? Because remember the difference between reality and fiction is fiction has to make sense. So the quality of speech, they say sticks and stones won't hurt my bones, but you know, an unkind word can scar a person for the rest of their life. A kind word can possibly save a person from the unnecessary trauma, the conditioned experience that they were hardwired in that early neuroplasticity that got soldered into their synapses. Maybe a kind word can change that all. So another one of my phrases is the mouth is the quill of the heart. The mouth is the quill of the heart. You know that when you're feeling good, you're coming from a different place and the words you choose reflect that. And when you're not feeling good, whether you're sick or you're pissy or depressed or whatever, your words also reflect that. And this is where you understand the commonality of my personal experience and is it reflective in any way of human experience? And of course it is because you're a human being. And there's a part where your own personal experience is not just individual, it's collective, it's universal. You can see this in the, in the variety and diversity of human beings, but there's a through line that's the same. Kind words are the same in an Eastern and Western mind, and unkind words are the same above and below the equator. It doesn't matter what your social system is, your political system, your religious system is. When you hear another person trash talking, you know something must be wrong because if they were feeling really good, those would not be the kind of words and the vibration behind those words, the intention, let's get back to where you're coming from. Right? So you know that something is off with them, right? You say to yourself, this person's not right. Because if they were right, the words that would come off their tongue would be a little sweeter, a little kinder, right? So really important to notice the quality of your speech when you're interacting with other people. Now the next thing, one of the things I like to remind people about the word attachment and the difference between the negative take that you get from the word attachment when you're studying yoga versus the potential positive take that you ought to get from attachment theory when you're studying psychoanalysis, but how it can also get skewed if you don't access it adequately and appropriately at the right time. So first, let's understand the negative aspect about attachment from the yoga point of view. There's an idea in yoga that desire is bad, that wanting something hangs you up because it puts a spin on things to have it be a certain way. And then you try to make that happen or you go for it and either you find out that it isn't that way or when you achieve it, it wasn't what you thought it was or you're dissatisfied because you didn't achieve it and you put yourself down or somebody shoots down your aspiration and tells you you're not worthy to do it or you can't do it, and you listen to them and it shuts you down. And the idea that even from the Buddhist point of view, right, suffering is based on desire, and not just having desire, but clinging to desire. And you know, all of Buddhism, you could say in one word, 
is uh, in one line is like, you know, it doesn't matter what you don't cling to, just don't cling, which means flow, let go, hard to do if you're very attached to the idea. And it doesn't matter what the idea is. I should eat a certain food. I should be certain uh, along the way at a certain point in my life. I should have accumulated this. I should marry this kind of person. I should have this kind of speech, this kind of house, wear this kind of clothes, think this kind of way. No, you have to leave the monolithic system and do this thinking for yourself, remember? Nonetheless, if you have this negative idea about desire, and again, in the Eastern philosophy, you got to remember, nothing good comes from the ego. you got to get rid of the ego. It's, it's the ego that's desiring all these things because it's all about me. And our culture really helps you indulge to the max in accumulating stuff for who? For me. And then you take the spiritual path and you're always checking yourself to see how am I doing? Am I any closer? And that's kind of a neurotic dependency. Kind of you're your own enabler. So they don't allow you to get attached. They want you to look through, see through the attachment in the negative sense and get rid of it. But then that means what? You're, you're a recluse. You don't connect to anybody. Your heart is closed. I don't think that's what they're really saying. So you have to sift through this and understand what's a mature way of taking the positive thing of what they're saying, but avoiding the negative thing, which is the fear of getting attached. Now we get back to psychoanalysis. When people are first born, if everything goes right, and that's a big thing to say because statistically, statistically speaking, it doesn't always go right. So let me get into a side thing here a little. You know. Statistically speaking, most women give birth and it turns out fine. But there's no guarantee that it will turn out fine. Right? Because once a woman is pregnant, Things can go wrong. She can have a miscarriage. There could be an abortion. There can be a preemie. There can be a cesarean. Or the person is not ready for it and they have a horrible experience because they're drugged out or something goes wrong in the delivery. Or the person is not ready to have a child. It happens, statistically speaking. So there's no guarantee. But the far majority of births, it comes out fine. And even if the mother isn't breastfeeding, it doesn't matter. As long as the baby is healthy and the mother's healthy, they're happy. But remember, traditionally speaking, right, no guarantee, but high statistical probability is that when the baby comes out and the mother bonds to the baby, so there's the facial recognition, the eye gazing, the umbilical cord is just long enough that the baby can get to the tit. And then, you know, if it works out well, and again, a lot of people have some trouble breastfeeding, whatever reason, but it's been an adaptation evolutionarily, the milk of human kindness being pressed into the into the baby, and now there's a new matrix for them that was just as comfortable and pro-life as the womb. And if it goes well, remember there's no guarantee that it will, but statistically speaking, a high percentage of people goes well. And what does that mean? It means that the child gets a positive attachment to their first experience in the world outside of the womb, where what their understanding is that the world is both a reliable and available and safe. Reliable, available, and safe. And if that's the initial imprinting, bonding experience that happens, and again, there's no guarantee that it will, but statistically speaking, the high amount of experiences go that way, then that will be a person who later on in life, even with all the other buffetings that happen, with not great parenting, and remember, parents don't have to be perfect, they just have to be good enough if they do that, even if they have other socially conditioned experiences with their peers or socialization in school or buffetings along the road with their friends or their siblings or life itself, they will still not be a dour personality who refuses to connect to another person. So in other words, relationships, intimacy can happen and that kind of person will be willing to connect to another person, to open their heart, even though that means vulnerability. And I think things can go wrong, high divorce rate, mind feels to negotiate when you start talking about, you know, religion and politics and money and sexuality. And Okay, I get it. But still your willingness to take the risk because you had early experiences that deep, deep down in your pre-verbal understanding, the world is reliable, available and safe. So I take the risks. However, 
in certain situations, unfortunately, way too many, the bonding doesn't happen. And the imprinting that the person gets is the world is not reliable, the world is not available, and the world is not safe. So from that lack of proper attachment that would have really imprinted upon you a positive spin on facing life, then two possibilities happen that skew the word attachment in this psychoanalytical sense and makes you not available. And that is number one, you're either attachment averse, attachment avoidant, or attachment anxious. And the spin on these is if you're attachment avoidant or attachment averse, you've imprinted so much hurt about not having that bonding experience that for the rest of your life, it nips at your heels and you never allow another person in because the pain of not having that available to you is such that I never want to face that again. So I won't even risk connecting to somebody. I sabotage the relationship or don't put myself in a position to have the relationship to begin with because I'm attachment avoidant or attachment averse. But the other split that happens when you have the negative take on, it's not reliable, it's not available, and it's not safe, is the anxious response. It makes me so panicky that there isn't anybody there that I'll do anything to have somebody there. I'll ask us. I'll flatter. I'll pick the wrong person. I'll be in abusive relationships just because someone is still there. At least I don't have to face being alone. So that kind of aversion based on your own anxiety to go it on your own or wait to learn to be the right person, not try to find the right person, that creates another kind of spin that makes the attachment theory, psychoanalytically speaking, skewed. So how do you find the balance between these two things? Yoga teaching you that there's a negative quality to the wrong kind of attachment when you're clinging, you're holding on for the wrong reasons, and it skews your whole desire system. But that's not the only way to be attached to people. You can be attached to people, or I say involved, but detached from the ultimate aim, because all you can do is invite people out to play. And then if they can't, for whatever reason, create some whole space for them, feel for them, that they're afraid, that they're threatened. And of course, they can't step out into joy. So can you hold space for them? It makes them realize, well, I've met a human being now who doesn't reject me for the fact that I'm sad or because this is what my life experience has been. They allow it to be. They accept me for that. They don't think I'm any less of a person. They'll even see beyond that into all the other qualities that are loving about me. And there, that revivifies me, right? So. They've trained themselves to look beyond. It's easy to see the flaws. What's wrong is always available. But to see the sparkle in another person, to recognize them, or what I call to bless them, to admire them, to mirror them. So that's why I always say, and I'm so thrilled to have this opportunity to share with people younger than myself. There's always generations coming after you. Even if you're in 20s, there are people in their teenage years and single digits who need big brothers and sisters, who need people who recognize them. And this is what I say to you. When was the last time you looked at a younger man or a younger woman and blessed them, which means recognize their magnificence and told them so? Unless you're so hurt that you're setting up your life where you have to have everybody admire you, mirror you, recognize you, encourage you, kiss my ring. If it's been a long time, it's never too late to say, oh, my God, how have I not been recognizing all the wonderful, beautiful people who are coming after me? I have to learn to empower them. And so first, of course, are you empowered? If not, I'm hoping that what I'm sharing is a kick in the ass, a gobsmack across the side of your head to get you going and empower yourself and then pass it on. Mentors are not just people who are 30, 40, 50, or 60 years older than you, they're usually only a generation and a half older than you. Your guitar teacher only has to be 25 and you're 10 and they're teaching you how to riff. They're your mentor. They don't have to be some wizened old guru with 50 years of guitar playing behind them. You get it? So let that go. You all, we all have our responsibility 
for passing on to the next generation and looking at them with a kindly eye, not the malocho, not the squint eye. People need to be felt that someone recognizes me, appreciates me, and then that empowers them. And then when they can come out of that, because you make them realize you got power, you got clout, you're worth a lot, you got love, you can do it better, I'm rooting for you, then it starts bringing them out of the shell, and then you can play together. You can invite creativity. So that's really important. And part of this is what I call the renaissance of your imagination. You have to start thinking outside the box, not like everybody else does, not looking to somebody else for leadership. And so I'll tell a little story as we're kind of winding down here that reminds you about thinking outside the box. And it's not only just because chimpanzees tell you, you don't peel the banana from the top where the stem is. You know, you ever see them? They open up the bottom and it pops right out, right? Okay, you can learn from uh, chimpanzees, right? But I like to tell the story of the Sufi fool, Mullah Nasruddin. And of course, he's a fool because it's so stupid what he does, but there's always wisdom inherent into it if you can find it. Every day, Mullah Nasruddin passes by customs, moving from one country to another, taking his donkey with him, and he gets shaken down by the customs official because everybody knows that Mullah Nasruddin is a smuggler. And so every time he goes past the customs from one country to another, they shake him down, they strip his clothes, they check every orifice, they look everywhere in the saddlebags of the donkey and the donkey's hooves and the donkey's ears and any place that some contraband could be hidden, they can't find a thing. 25 years, day after day, and he has that shit-eating grin on his face, kind of mocking the customs officials because he knows they know he is a smuggler and they can't find squat. And it, it miffs the custom official to no end because they know he's smuggling, but they can't prove anything. And then the time, time comes where Mullah Nasruddin goes across, and then one day the head customs official meets him on the street and says, you know, I'm no longer in the field, and the statue of limitations is over, so I can't go back and try you for any crime that you committed, but I got to know before I die. Everybody knows you were smuggling. You know you were doing it. I know you were doing it. We never found anything. Can you tell me, were you really smuggling? And he says, yes, I was. I knew it. Was it gold? No. Was it diamonds? No. Was it drugs? No. Was it some kind of currency we couldn't find? No. But what were you smuggling? Donkeys. So I don't know what thinking outside of the box represents for you. I can only tell you that my path has always been the same, whether I translate it into yoga or not. First, find the things you love to do. Pleasure is the tie that binds. I call it the egocentric teachings. By trial and error, find out what are the strings of sympathetic resonance. Like when you pluck a guitar string, the strings next to it vibrate in sympathy, even if you can't hear it. And when they vibrate in sympathy, because you found the thing that turns you on, it's as if, metaphorically speaking, a thread from the other world pokes its head into this world. Where did that come from? And you start pulling on the thread. And the more you pull on the thread, you create the tapestry of your own existence. And you weave your life through the twists and turns of the wild roller coaster of your life. And then when you get this picture, you take it off the loom that you've woven yourself and you put it to good use. You enjoy it first yourself and then hopefully you serve other people through your gift. Now, if it was simple as putting the pedal to the metal and finding what you love to do, I wouldn't have to go any further. But the truth is every woman comes across something that scars them. The degree of trauma or pathology I'm not going to argue about it. 
I mean, you know, we're not living in a refugee camp. Most of us don't have to walk five miles a day to get potable water that may have cholera in it. The things that people have to go through, most of us are filtered away from those things. It doesn't mean we don't have the right to complain about what I call bourgeois duka, you know, first world problems. What, my car is not ready. The cleaning is cleaning, my dry cleaning is not ready. Or, you know, oh, they didn't have kale today? Get real. But nonetheless, each one of us has something that's happened in our past that represents those experience dependent conditionings that created the wrong kind of plasticity in our brain. It kind of soldered it in place. And unless you train your mind to create new synapses, you may not know that there are other possibilities. Remember, don't make the limitation of your own experience the measurement of all possibilities. So in addition to the egocentric things, at some point, you have to have the guts and the insight, which means support, to go into the dark stuff. I call it the shadow. You could just call it what's in your subconscious mind. But you have to have a positive attitude towards why would I want to go back and deal with that stuff that hurt me or didn't feel good because you didn't have the skill set to deal with it when you were young. And maybe you still don't have the skill set now. But you can learn. You can apprentice yourself to people who can help you. Healers, shamans, psychoanalysts, 12-step programs. There's no dearth of things you can do to align yourself and heal yourself and then bring the gift of your healing back to re-energizing the things that you love to do so you can play in life and invite other people out to play with you. So that, I would say, is my basic message for tonight and, and all the time. And so I hope that you would get a chance to speak to me. And if people want to make a comment right now, I'll stay on a few extra minutes and, and share with you. But other than that, uh, I hope that you will take my website information down and go there and cherry pick everything that's for free. Thank you very much, GabrielHalpern.com. I got so many things on my YouTube station for you. And if you go there, you'll also see the affirmations and the pranayama videos and the invitation to continue a dialogue with me at whatever level you want to. I'm the kind of person where even though I'm very busy, if you mirror back to me, I'll get right back to you because nothing is more important then continuing to connect to people and offering whatever kind of help and service I can with whatever resources I have available. And even if I find from talking to you that I can't help you, I know a lot of other people in a lot of other ways, I'll network you to somebody else so you can find the path that takes you away from me. I'd still feel that's a fulfilling relationship if I can help you move your piece on the chessboard to help you not get checkmated and learn to be a better game player. So. The last thing I want to say is if you stay in contact with me, you'll see my itinerary where I'm doing online Zoom teaching and where I might be in the future doing in-person teaching. And uh, you guys gave shameless marketing about what's happening next July. I'm going to give shameless marketing the 25th anniversary of my annual Mexico vacation, which has been shut down for the last two years, is back on again in the end of February, early March in Puerto Morelos, a jewel on the Yucatan Peninsula. And this is our 25th anniversary. I'm sure it's going to be a big wing ding. And as of September 1st, we all, or should say Labor Day is when we traditionally open up the registrations. We'll take 30 people. I know it's going to fill really quickly. So again, if you go to my website, Gabriel, GabrielHalpern.com, you'll see the information. Please feel free to sign up or ask me any questions you want. I'd love to have you deal with uh, me and the wonderful other yogis not unsimilar to the people who you attract to yourself when you do your, your breath pulse meetings, uh, but in a beautiful private uh, location, you know, it's like old Mexico, very, very safe, great food, beautiful environment, great beach, great yoga. And I can only hope that somebody will pick it up or if not good for you, network to somebody else who might want to do it. And maybe I'll hope to see you there in 2022. But if not, once again, I thank you in Dallas, I thank you for he helping to set up the uh, StreamYard video and also like to give a shout out always to Mark Brower and Dan Urowski, two of the brothers who helped hit me to uh, your guys' community and give me an opportunity to share with you what my passion is. So thank you very much. I'm very professional. It's eight o'clock. We've ended <laughs> up time. So 
A lot of thanks, Gabriel. Appreciate it. For the record, I've been to Puerto Morelos and it's amazing. So I can I can at least vouch for the location. Good. Awesome. Thanks for another great talk. It was it was as always very insightful. Great. So communicate, everybody. Pong it back. Even what it's never about the numbers. Even one person. I'd love to talk to you. So again, da Dallas. Thank you so much, Davis. We'll see you soon. Okay, thanks. See ya. Great. Thanks, everybody. This has been another great Breathe Pulse. The internet and social media is quite a hectic place, and I am very grateful that you've decided to spend your time on this feed here instead of elsewhere. I hope that it's brought to new value, and um, excited for Breathe in 2022. Hope to see you all there. Uh, feel free to get at my DMs if you have any questions. This will be on the Breathe Facebook in perpetuity, so you're welcome to look at it. And just to one more time uh, plug Gabriel, uh, this guy is a wealth of information, and he puts out content literally every day. I'm signed up on his email list, and I get an email every day of a breathing exercise or a talk or something of the like. It's definitely worth signing up for, and it's free. And uh, until next time, uh, keep it chill. Don't rush it. Just crush it. I'm out.